So the goal of NEON after this long introduction is to enable understanding and forecasting of the impacts of climate change, land use change, and invasive species on continental scale ecology. And NSF's mode of operation is to provide infrastructure to uh, a huge community of principal investigators, educational users, and citizens to support research, education, training, and decision making in these areas. And that's the goal. So NEON itself is not a research organization. It's a research infrastructure organization. Our staff will do a certain amount of research as part of the design, maintenance, and advancement of the observatory. But the real goal of this observatory is to provide a capability uh, for the science and educational communities and the environmental management community of the U.S. And uh, in that goal statement, forecasting, and by the way, the goal statement was something that was given to NEON, not something that we came up with. Forecasting was one of really the major objectives, was providing the kind of regular, in-depth, powerful information that could be used to develop predictive models. Well, when we started thinking about forecasting as a design requirement, being somewhat engineering uh, oriented in our approach, we wondered what was really meant by ecological forecasting, since it's not actually something that happens a great deal. And we, we came up with two definitions. Uh, from the literature. First, what is the most likely future state of an ecological system? So that's the equivalent of the, of the weather forecast. Given the state of the system today, what is the most likely state of the system a year from now, nine months from now, ten years from now? Um, and, and the second definition is the what if sort of a forecast. What is the most likely future state of a system given a decision today? And this, of course, is the, is the canonical decision support question. A manager has to make a decision about a watershed or a forest uh, or an urban area, and, and they have several options available to them, and they want to know the most likely outcome of choosing one of those options over another. And both of the, now that second one isn't really part of weather forecasting, but it's very clearly part of environmental management. And so the goal is to provide an information infrastructure that supports both of these types of forecasting for ecological science. And that means both the need for observations of the starting point, the initial conditions for the forecast, and the need for quantitative information about specific processes that determine the evolution of the system. For example, the sensitivity of organisms to temperature or drought or uh, fragmentation of habitat by urban development or what have you. Now, ecological science has typically taken its, its sort of uh, research paradigm from biology and has focused on wh what some people call the sort of heroic hypothesis test. You have a hypothesis and you wish to either reject it or not or you have two alternate hypotheses and you want to do the critical experiment that allows you to distinguish between those two hypotheses. And the preferred research approach is the manipulative experiment where you change a factor and you observe the response of the system to that deliberate intervention. Well, that's a great way to do science. It doesn't work for everything and particularly it doesn't work for very large scale systems like the whole planet or a watershed or a continent. And so there are hybrid approaches to hypothesis testing that have been developed. And atmospheric science is, is, uh, is a good example here. This shows um, one measure of the skill of the weather forecast from 1955 when quantitative forecasting by uh, NOAA first began, more or less up to the present, to 2005. And what one can think of this as is a series of literally millions of tests of a hypothesis. Literally millions of forecasts of what the weather will be in an hour, in six hours, in 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, compared to observations. That's what the skill score is. It's the, it's the uh, misfit between the forecast and the analysis. And the amazing thing here is that it leads to this sort of 
quite dramatic but very monotonic improvement in understanding. It's not a fully empirical approach. It involves capturing a hypothesis in a numerical model and then testing it over and over and over again against under many different conditions of the system. El Nino years, La Nina years, drought years, wet years, and so on. So that as this complex, very initial condition dependent system evolves, one is testing the ability of a quantitative understanding to forecast its behavior, again, all over parameter space. And that's the kind of science that NEON is really intended uh, to facilitate. And so one of the things that we've done in designing NEON is to actually simulate the observatory. We've built a statistical model of the observatory and we've looked at its ability to detect and quantify a variety of different types of trends. Uh, one trend that's really actually quite interesting to detect is a level trend, uh, a trend with zero slope. That's the first panel here on the left. Another trend that's interesting to detect is the linear trend. And that's what's illustrated in this uh, center panel. And then finally, we know that some biological and biogeochemical responses are nonlinear. For example, many processes respond exponentially to changes in temperature uh, and in some cases in, in, in moisture. So we wanted to simulate the sort of variability and response uh, of processes and then ask the question, uh, can the observatory detect and retrieve the parameters of those response? So we're simulating the observatory. We're adding a variety of different types of bias and, and, and noise and we're asking how powerful the observatory is in responding to this. So for example, this is a simulated exponential response to a linear temperature trend, something like what we might expect for the prevalence of certain types of diseases or for respiration of, of CO2 from, from ecosystems. And we asked the question, um, can we retrieve the parameters of that response? In other words, not only can we detect the trend, First, second, can we establish the functional form of the response? That is, can we determine that it's exponential? And then third, can we actually estimate the functional response parameters of that nonlinear response? Well, the, the simulations indicate that even with very powerful techniques, um, there are some limitations to this for this type of observatory. We can determine the functional form of this type of response. And fairly powerfully, we can determine, uh, distinguish between linear and nonlinear responses. But even with 20 or 30 years of data, uh, retrieving in an unambiguous way the parameters of that nonlinear response remains quite challenging. So again, I mentioned earlier that the observatory is designed to support both uh, in situ observations and manipulative experiments. For certain types of functional response, despite what I said about the weather forecasting example, for certain types of process, there's really no uh, superior way of understanding than process studies and experiments. And again, the observatory is designed to facilitate that sort of integrated approach to research. I'll go by this one. And uh, fundamentally, um, this figure captures a little bit the way we think about the forecasting problem. Starting at the bottom, we recognize that nature includes processes at multiple scales. We have fine scaled processes at say organism or cellular scales. And we have large scale processes, for example, climate forcing through the El Nino pattern or something like that. Those processes combine to produce the multi-scaled patterns of process distribution and abundance that we observe in nature. Now above that, comes the observing system. And within the NEON system, we basically have two observing strategies. Point sampling, local or regional uh, sampling, again, people in the field, instruments on towers, and remote sensing, either using airborne or space-borne assets. Now, ideally, what we would like to do is combine these two types of information in a spatial temporal model and produce a forecast, either of the future, 
or of the unobserved regions in between the point samples on the ground. And uh, the state of the art has been advancing on this sort of thing quite rapidly. One of the examples that we've been working on with, with USGS scientists are spatial forecasts of invasion and invasibility. That is how readily different systems are invaded by new species. Again, we start with the various scales of process that exist in nature, uh, leading to the distribution and abundance of invasive species uh, that we can observe either using site-based or spatial and remote sensing-based information. And then integrating those different types of observation together into a model, in this case a kind of a model called an ecological niche model. And this is an example of uh, sampling and then extrapolating the, um, the potential habitat suitability for uh, Aedes aegypti. This is, a, this is a very nasty little mosquito. This is the mosquito that carries dengue fever. It's basically an urban mosquito. It likes the temperature and humidity conditions and the sort of high density of um, food, that is to say us, uh, in, in urban environments. And this is a calibrated model basically projecting the potential future distribution of that mosquito uh, in a future warmer, wetter climate. Now, we might also use this same observing system to consider the problem of biological carbon sequestration. Again, it's the same format that I've shown you now three times with key carbon relevant processes occurring at multiple scales in nature, producing patterns of carbon fluxes and stocks on the landscape that we can observe using site level observations and spatial observations that in this case include not only remote sensing, but also very extensive national survey programs like the forest inventory or the natural resources inventory that capture forest and agricultural system carbon. And again, that those two types of, there's multiple types of information can be integrated together into a, into a model to produce a spatial extrapolation and potentially a temporal forecast. Now, for carbon, uh, we have the interesting uh, added aspect that by solving the land surface carbon balance equation, we predict gradients of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, above the canopy. And those can then be compared to atmospheric observations. So there's a way of doing bottom up, top down uh, calibration and validation of a model like this. So again, this is a, a very interesting and important potential application of this type of observing system.